Hello, my name is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to cover our second unit, ecology, and it's going to be broken up into the five benchmarks, which are benchmarks five through nine. We're going to start with benchmark five. Okay, benchmark five is about ecosystems and how are they organized into different types. And living things are always going to be living as part of an ecosystem somewhere on Earth. And ecosystems are built from two parts. There's the biotic part and the abiotic part. The biotic part of an ecosystem, otherwise known as a community, is made up of the different plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, etc., that are all living together in that ecosystem. The abiotic part of an ecosystem are the non-living components that these living things need. For example, their soil, the water, the climate, the light, the atmosphere, all those things that can vary. Ecosystems are also known as biomes. Uh, biomes are ecosystems that are limited to a geographic location. They're often described by where they are. For example, deserts in northern Africa are called the Sahara Desert, and the, the dry, twiggy, um, thorny areas in California is known as the California Chaparral Biome. Uh, the Caribbean Coral Reef. There are also coral reefs in other warm oceans, but you could just study the Caribbean Coral Reef, and you could call it a, bi that, a biome. Some ecosystems, for example, the deserts, uh, everybody's seen deserts, hot and dry, not very much plant life, uh, a lot of animal life, but it comes out at night. Okay, you have coral reefs, made up of communities of corals and algaes and lots of fish, uh, also lots of invertebrates like um, shrimp and uh, lobsters and um, octopi and, and things that swim and things that crawl and things that bury themselves. Okay, you also have the rainforest ecosystem, which obviously is very wet. They get a lot of rain. Therefore, plants that live there need a lot of water um, most of the year. Then we have the tundra, which is so cold and so windy and so dark most of the year that trees can't grow there. And we have taiga, which is another name for coniferous or conifer tree forests, trees that look like um, Christmas trees and have cones on them. Um, shaped like Christmas trees so that snow will slide off their branches. Taiga are very snowy areas that have long, cold, dark winters and relatively short summers. And finally, we have deciduous forests, like what we have here in Virginia. Um, you have four seasons, spring, summer, winter, and fall. You have some water falling from the sky in all four seasons. And the trees that dominate here have flat leaves. They don't have needles, uh, known as deciduous trees. And um, the northeastern United States, its um, climax community is deciduous forest. Okay, since communities are biotic and they're made up of plants, animals, etc., all living together in the same place, all sharing food and shelter, okay, there's going to be populations. And populations, of course, are the same species living in the same place at the same time. And two organisms are the same species if some criteria are met. Okay, if they can get together, and they recognize each other as mates, and they can physically mate with each other, and their offspring can reproduce themselves to make grand offspring, so to speak, then you have two organisms that are the same species. Now sometimes two organisms can be very close and almost be the same species, but not quite. For example, horses and donkeys can mate with each other under the right situation and produce offspring called mules. Now mules are neither horse nor donkey. They're kind of a mix between the two, but mules are not normal. Um, they can't reproduce on their own. They're what we call sterile. Um, mules can't reproduce. They're, they're dead ends. So if you want to grow mules, you've got to grow horses and donkeys. Another example, ligers. Uh, ligers are produced in zoos when lions and tigers grow up together and they don't learn to hate each other and they reproduce together to produce these hybrids. Uh, ligers though aren't very healthy when they, they tend to grow too large and have metabolic problems. Okay, populations also compete with each other for different things. For example, food, water, and space. Uh, these two leopards, members of the same species, are obviously arguing over something, probably territory. Uh, because they're the same species, this is competition within species. You can also have competition for food, water, and space between two different species. For example, a lion and a leopard here in this picture. Um, they're competing with each other and they're not the same species. Now, competition between different species is going to cause problems. Uh, it, it's damaging to both populations. So evolution has 
or evolution causes species to evolve different niches. Now, niches are kind of like lifestyles for an organism. And each species is going to have its own niche. And the theory is that no two populations can live together in exactly the same niche. They have to divide up things in some way that's different. If they don't, one population is going to outcompete the other, and one population is going to go extinct. Uh, let me give you guys an example of this. Uh, lions and leopards both like to eat the same food. Lions hunt zebra, antelope, warthog, lots of other things that live in the African grassland. So do leopards. Uh, leopards like these foods too. So it looks like lions and leopards are directly competing with, e with each other. So how are their niches different? Well, lions hunt in groups uh, called prides, whereas leopards hunt by themselves, alone. And lions prefer grassland. That's why they're colored that way. Their, their, their coat color blends in with dry grass. Whereas leopards, they prefer to hunt in trees or hunt from trees or where there are bushes. Their coat color is, is, has evolved to provide camouflage and dappled light or light with a mix of shade and light. So these animals do compete for the same food and they do live in the same areas, but they do divide up their niches slightly differently, mainly by where they prefer to hunt. Um, lions and leopards do not get along though, and if a lion and a leopard meet, the leopard's going to run up a tree and try to get away from the lion, and if a pride of lion catches a leopard away from a tree, they're going to kill it. So niches overlap a lot, but they're not exactly identical for these two cats. Okay, populations grow in different ways, and populations can grow very fast. When that happens, we call it a boom, and populations can also decrease very fast. We call that a crash. And limiting factors are the factors in biology that control when and how much a population can grow. And limiting factors come in two flavors. There's the abiotic limiting factors and the biotic limiting factors. You've seen these words already. Uh, abiotic limiting factors are things that have nothing to do with living organisms, things like droughts and fire and flood and other natural disasters. Biotic factors are the things that do involve a living component, such as diseases, running out of food, uh, competition, um, some shortage of something else, like uh, maybe an animal needs to nest in trees and there are no more trees or there's no more room in the trees. Uh, that would be a biotic limiting factor. Okay, many populations in nature, when they grow, they maintain a steady level eventually. And let me show you what I'm talking about here. This is called carrying capacity. So if we have a population of rabbits that's growing over 10 years, so the population goes up and up and up and then it starts to level off. It gets to a level where there are, there's enough food, enough space, enough water to support a certain number of rabbits and no more. Okay, this amount is called the carrying capacity. So on this particular graph, the carrying capacity for this population in this ecosystem is about 85 rabbits. Um, it goes up a little bit past that, it comes down a little bit below that, but over time, at least from about seven years to about 10 years, it's maintaining an average of about 85 rabbits. That's what we mean by carrying capacity. Some populations don't reach a stable carrying capacity. Okay, they, their populations are always going up and down, crashing and booming. Uh, for example, wolves and their prey species, moose, um, moose populations climb and then fall when there get to be a lot of wolves and then when there's not enough moose to eat the wolf population crashes so these two populations kind of cycle or dance around each other constantly going up and down and up and down over time so not all populations uh, naturally reach a carrying capacity um, this brings us to what happens when populations are introduced to an area where they weren't before. Uh, you may have heard about Australia's problem with rabbits. Okay, If you look at these three pictures, cute little bunnies, all right? Rabbits, these are European rabbits. They come from Europe, and when the Europeans settled Australia, they brought their rabbits with them, and they turned them loose in Australia. Now, Australia has no rabbits, or at least it didn't. So beginning in about 1850, there, when Europeans really started to settle Australia and set up their sheep ranches, they brought rabbits with them and they turned them loose. And the rabbits do what rabbits do very well. They started to reproduce. And their populations went way up. And then, in recent history, in the last 30 years, the populations have crashed and now they're starting to creep back up. What's going on? Well, the rabbits were introduced to Australia. 
They had no competition, so they did very well up into the 1950s. They actually became pests. Then people introduced diseases to try to take the rabbit population down, and it crashed. The disease introduction worked pretty well. Uh, but now rabbits are, are developing or evolving immunity to these diseases and their populations are starting to come back up. So Australia still has a problem with rabbits, but it's not the rabbit's fault. They were brought there from their natural ecosystem and introduced to a new ecosystem where things were good for them, but ultimately bad for them. All right, that ends our first benchmark. We will pick up with benchmark six in the next podcast or next videocast. Thanks, Mom.